I'm Jana Robinson. I'm director of, of the Space Security Program at the Prague Security Studies Institute. We have, we're located both in Prague and Washington, so we always think we are well positioned to try to bridge the transatlantic uh, uh, dialogue. Um, uh, first, I'd like to uh, again thank Dr. Henry and CSIS for hosting the event here. Uh, we've had a great experience yesterday and today uh, with Vice Admiral Richard. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, I'm pleased to moderate our first panel uh, on uh, space crisis dynamics. We have four distinguished panelists uh, that I'd like to introduce first. Uh, first, Todd Harrison, uh, Director of Aerospace Security Project here at CSIS. Uh, next to him, we've, uh, we've got uh, Brian Whedon, uh, Director of Planning uh, at the Secure World Foundation. Victoria Sampson, uh, Director of the Washington Wall Office of the Secure World Foundation, and Zach Cooper, who is fellow at CSIS focusing on Asian security and in particular, Japan. Uh, CSIS and the Secure World Foundation organized uh, a most interesting roundtable in November 2016 on the topic of space crisis dynamics uh, that I was pleased to take part in. And speakers will briefly review the event and uh, maybe uh, give us some insights on some of the findings uh, that they had. So let's, uh, let's get underway, Todd. Um, how has the space security environment changed over time? We've heard some of it already this morning. And uh, why, mainly, wh what, why is it significant for the United States uh, and its allies? Yes, uh, thank you, Jana. Um, you know, I'll, I'll pick up where Vice uh, Admiral Richard uh, discussed briefly in, in his earlier talk. Um, the space environment has changed dramatically for the U.S. military, and that's really one of the things that prompted the uh, exercise that we did together in partnership with the Secure World Foundation. Um, so, if you think back, you know, the, the space age started, you know, in 1957 with the launch of Sputnik One. And throughout uh, virtually the entire Cold War, uh, space was dominated, it was largely dominated by the two superpowers, the US and the Soviet Union. Uh, and during that time, our military space capabilities really focused on the nuclear mission primarily, uh, for missile warning, for ISR, for comms, um, and tactical missions uh, were really a, of secondary importance for space systems. I mean, if you think to Vietnam, uh, you know, what kind of space systems were we using in Vietnam? Was it really uh, that critical uh, to our conventional operations? Not so much. Um, and because our space systems, our military space systems, were really focused on uh, the nuclear mission, uh, both sides, U.S. and the Soviets, regarded an attack on those space systems as uh, a prelude or a part of a full-scale nuclear attack. Uh, and so deterrence in space held because it was linked to nuclear deterrence. Uh, and so that's why we came to regard space as somewhat of a sanctuary. It's not a complete sanctuary, but you know, if things went bad in space, uh, that mean, meant that things were going really bad here on Earth. Um, now, I would argue, uh, and I'm gonna steal some terminology here from Tom Kremens, Associate Administrator at NASA. He has talked about the second space age. I would argue that the second space age really started around 1990, 1991, uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union uh, and Operation Desert Storm. Operation Desert Storm uh, was really the first uh, large-scale conventional operation that showcased our space capabilities in a tactical environment, not a strategic environment. Um, and so that was kind of a wake-up call uh, to the rest of the world that things like precision navigation and timing, satellite communications, ISR, uh, even missile warning, uh, had tactical applications as well. They were not just something that supported strategic missions. Um, also, what has started to change gradually uh, in the 1990s and has accelerated in recent years is that space is not just about the two superpowers. There are dozens of nations uh, that have significant space capabilities, uh, a lot of private companies as well. Uh, and now our military space capabilities support the full spectrum of conflict. Um, uh, the military also increasingly relies on commercial space capabilities, so that muddies the waters a bit as well. And many of our military systems uh, 
they actually are dual use. Uh, they support both tactical and strategic operations. And so we're at a point now uh, where deterrence uh, has weakened and deterrence is more uncertain. Um, so looking at the challenges of the second space age, and that's really what we wanted to explore here in our tabletop exercises, uh, was you know, space is no longer a sanctuary. You'll, you'll hear that a lot today, I think. And that's because counter space capabilities um, are proliferating. And it's not just kinetic. It's not just ASAT weapons. That's, we like to think of that uh, first because it's cool, things blow up. Uh, you know, kinetic weapons are absolutely a threat, a risk, uh, but I think what's more worrisome are the non-kinetic threats. Uh, jamming, uh, you know, high power uh, microwave weapons, uh, other forms of directed energy, lasing, dazzling of satellites. Um, and, you know, in some cases, the barrier to entry to get into those capabilities, like to buy a jammer, is not that high. Uh, and so even pretty, you know, low level, uh, countries with pretty low levels of military capabilities can afford these uh, and get into that and pose a threat to us. So I think we are at a point now where we realize we have to expect that a conventional conflict on Earth uh, can include attacks on space systems, including attacks on some of our dual use space systems. Uh, they are not immune. Also, we see a commercial space sector is growing rapidly. Uh, that complicates things. There are some potential breakthroughs coming uh, and reductions in the cost of access to space. Uh, we see a lot of commercial companies planning massive constellations of satellites. Hasn't happened yet, but it is starting to happen. We see that. It's creating space traffic management issues. Some of these commercial capabilities are treading into areas that used to be dominated by the military, uh, and so the military is figuring out how to operate uh, with those companies. Uh, and these more sophisticated commercial space capabilities uh, are becoming ubiquitous. They're, they're gonna be available to everyone, even our adversaries, even non-state actors. Uh, and you know, the final point I would make is I think our military space architectures have been too slow to adapt to this reality. You know, it's been 10 years since the Chinese ASAT test, and that was really a wake up uh, I think for a lot in the space, a lot of people in the space community, that this is real. The threats are real, um, but our architectures are slow to adapt. It, it takes a generation uh, to change out uh, our military space architectures to make them more resilient, more dispersed, uh, and so that's something that we wanted to explore in this tabletop exercise. Thank you, Tom. So, Brian, uh, given what Todd just said. How did you structure the tabletop exercise and what were the main objectives? Well, going into it, we, we had two objectives we really wanted to try and tackle. Um, one of them was uh, you know, raising awareness at the national level um, what impact certain architectures, as, as Todd mentioned, or policies, uh, doctrines, space capabilities, what impact those had on a crisis, uh, crisis dynamics involving space. Um, you know, were there identified gaps that it would have been great if we had this capability here, or would have been, you know, this policy here was really useful or was not useful. Um, and the second is related to that, can we identify gaps in existing what I'll call mechanisms? And that includes both policies, but also legal structures, communication pathways, um, capabilities that can help stabilize crises and deter conflict. Um, are, are there, the, are there are they suitable or are there gaps in those capabilities uh, that we wish we'd have in place? And that would help inform things that would come in the future. You could say, you know, if we only had capability X or if we only had uh, our architecture construct Y or a communication mechanism Z, that might help stabilize future conflicts. So those were our two big uh, objectives going into it. So, so how do we structure this? Um, you know, TTXs and, and war games are, are not new, uh, not even for space. Uh, the U.S. military, the Air Force Space Command, has been doing them for quite a while. There's a long-running series called the Shriver War Game, started in the early 2000s, that Air Force Space Command has been doing to test some of these same things that we looked at. Um, so in that case, it's, what we did is not exactly new. We did have a couple of, of, in our minds, rather unique spins on the way the, the Shriver Games takes the situation. Um, you know, the Shriver War Game, uh, in recent years has done a focus on the crisis part of the situation, but that is typically not the major focus uh, because one of the big 
reasons to hold the Street of War game is for the military to exercise what the actual war fighting might look like so they can figure out what capabilities they need in the future to fight and win wars. We felt there was a, a need to focus more on the crisis dynamic portion, that early initial, you know, there's a crisis situation, uh, it hasn't yet escalated to open conflict, and, and to watch what those dynamics are and, and see what drives it towards conflict and what doesn't. Um, so that was one of the big differences we had in ours. And that's why we call it the crisis dynamics game uh, and not necessarily a war game. Um, and the second is that the Shreve of War games take place in a fairly high classified setting and there's only a certain number of people that can participate uh, and the information that's published afterwards about what happened and what the lessons were is pretty uh, tightly controlled. Uh, and I totally, we totally understand that because the, it's meant to inform U.S. military architectures, capabilities, doctrine and that's stuff that you, know, you don't want to broadcast to the world. However, we did feel there was a need to get a broader audience aware of the issues involved with space crisis dynamics and these sorts of exercises than could otherwise participate in a classified military war game. Uh, we wanted to bring in other disciplines, wanted to bring international actors, and have a broader discussion about the results. So that's why we decided to hold one that was unclassified uh, and, and had a broader mix of participants. So as far as, as structure goes, um, we, we, we had about 20 people that played. We broke them up across four teams. Uh, the teams were fictional countries that we modeled to resemble, in some ways, real world countries. But we wanted not to have it mired in, you know, if we played real world countries, suddenly that brings in real world geopolitics. And we, want, we, didn't, think, we didn't want that to distract from kind of the ability to play the game. Um, and those four teams ran through three different scenarios over the course of two days. Uh, and again, the scenarios were designed to somewhat resemble real world potential situations and real world issues, uh, but they were not meant to uh, specifically simulate a, a, a real world situation down to the T, because again, we wanted to kind of abstract it a bit uh, from the current geopolitics. Uh, so just briefly on the three scenarios. The first one, uh, the, the issue was basically there was a, a, an island chain that was disputed territory uh, between several different countries, uh, and, and they all kind of wanted it for resources. Um, and in the case of the scenario, one of the uh, countries, Orange, uh, said, you know what, we're going to issue a license to one of our companies to go and drill for oil in that resource chain, in that island chain, uh, and we're going to put our military in there to basically provide them support and cover. Well, that then generated conflict with the other countries who disputed the claims over that island. Uh, and, and there, some of the early space things we saw where the Orange, when they went in to protect their military operations to protect the commercial, they did some local uh, jamming of the public GPS signals, right? And they were okay because they had military GPS, uh, but that created problems for some of the other teams who were using only the public GPS. Um, and so, so this was an interesting question kind of around, you know, uh, as I said, you know, resources and, and disputed territory and the role that space plays in kind of over the horizon operations. Um, the second scenario, the focus was on border, terror, border tensions and terrorism. Uh, we had a scenario where there are two countries who had a history of tensions between them. Uh, there was a, a, a rogue element in the intelligence services of one country that uh, helped sponsor a terror attack and the other one uh, that eventually came to light that inflamed border tensions. And it was all about kind of around the, the buildup of tensions and host potential hostilities as each side kind of postures to defend itself. And, and that scenario touched on this issue of at what point does do you get into preeminence, right? At what point do you see the other side preparing for an attack or to, to attack you that that might allow you to do something on your end, particularly involving space? Um, and then the third scenario, we focused on uh, a, a proxy war and insurgency, where there was a country uh, that had a, a change of, of governments, um, um, you know, a new government came into power, uh, and they were being openly supported by one country. Uh, meanwhile, the deposed government was being covertly supported by another country. And so you had this proxy war insurgency going on that was using space. Uh, there was, you know, jamming of propaganda broadcasts. There was space being used to support the insurgency. Uh, and that drove another set of dynamics about how that might pull in some of the outside parties. Um, and also in that one, we threw in a space weather event that created a little bit more confusion and chaos in terms of, you know, does something happen to my satellites because somebody's jamming to it, or does something happen just because it got died because of a natural event? 
Um, so those were the three scenarios we looked at, and, and it, was, it was interesting to kind of see the reactions, and I think Victoria's gonna talk a little bit about you know, where those went. Thank you, Brian. I must say, from my perspective, uh, one of the hardest thing that was at the uh, tabletop exercise was aggregating all the information that they were constantly coming in and then actually communicating the next steps in real time to the partners and allies, notwithstanding the adversaries in case there was some kind of effort to de-escalate. So uh, I'm sure a lot of folks have much more experience uh, with that on a day-to-day -day basis. But Victoria, I think for you, the, the easy question. So what were the main findings of yeah. the exercise? Easy peasy. Um, before I get started, I'd also like to say that the scenarios that Brian just described are available on our website, and I believe CSIS is as well, if you got a taste of it, want to read a little bit more. Um, so I just want to be, um, before I talk about the lessons we learned, I just thought of note of caution. Um, these are my takeaways. These did not mean that every time you would run the scenario, you would get these same takeaways. I've been told repeatedly you can play the same scenario with the same people on the same day and get different results every time. So a grain of salt. Having said that, um, it was very interesting to see based on the scenario that um, there was a real reluctance to use kinetic force against satellites. It was seen as hugely escalatory. Um, however, radio frequency interference was considered to be completely on the table, which given, as we heard from the previous speaker, the law of armed conflict for space does not know what to do about radio frequency interference. That's a little bit unsettling. Um, interestingly enough, oftentimes when theorists talk about war um, against space objects, they say, well, temporary and reversible means are considered to be less escalatory because, hey, they're temporary and reversible. You're not going to lose the asset entirely. In our scenarios, it actually was not seen as non-threatening as some might think. Um, they actually said, well, you know, if our satellite has been damned or dazzled that, and we lost that capability this one time, then we could lose it at any point. Therefore, we, not, we cannot depend upon the space resource. Therefore, we're considered at a loss. So that was, that was an interesting for me. Um, yeah, as I said, kinetic anti-satellites were considered very escalatory. The threat was considered to be enough. So that was used a couple times, either as a saber rattling or an attempt to prevent going nuclear. Um, adversaries were very concerned about affecting strategic assets in space because that was seen as being a very escalatory as well. Um, but the distinction between tactical and strategic assets was not as great as you might think. Oftentimes, um, they thought, well, we can go after a tactical asset, not strategic, but that the, even the um, players admitted that that um, line would not be as clear in the real world. It's very hard to tell oftentimes where the threshold is between tactical and strategic. Um, In-kind response was not necessary, so if um, someone's satellite or what have you was damned or otherwise interfered with, you could attack ground stations, you did not have to immediately go after someone else's satellite as well. As I said before, cyber attacks were considered legitimate tools of conflict, um, and they were used repeatedly during every scenario. Um, and then, interestingly, we had kind of a hot wash as soon as the scenarios were over after the two days. And one of the teams stated they found um, offensive cyber capabilities to be consistently more useful than space control capabilities. And most of the other teams did agree with that. And they said this is because cyber capabilities were perceived as being usable, whereas space control capabilities were largely not considered usable. Um, space capabilities in themselves were actively used in attempts to avoid crisis escalation. You saw satellite imagery being released to improve situational awareness, counterclaims about capabilities in the region, assess damages, things like that. Um, space was used as a soft power outreach. Um, oftentimes imagery or ISR were shared um, as a way to kind of build relationships. Um, at one point, there was a discussion of code of conduct, interestingly enough, for electric magnetic interference, but otherwise the concept of norms of responsible behavior was not really brought up at any point during the scenarios. Instead, most of the teams focused on bilateral relationships. Um, as Brian said, space weather and or natural effects did play a role in crisis power dynamics and perceptions. Um, and then I will say that while there was reluctance to use anti-satellite capabilities, you know, after two days of doing this, one of the teams got a little antsy, decided they want to take the car out and kick the tires a little bit, and they thought, okay, <laughs> we're doing it. We're going to, we have a blinded satellite, someone blinded one of our satellites, we're just gonna ram it into someone else's satellite and create a large amount of debris. Um, interestingly enough, what they're trying to do is prevent the other um, adversary from doing ISR. That military mission was not stopped, even though they created a tremendous amount of debris in the process of 
ramming their satellite into someone else's. The other country's satellite was, or the other country's military was still able to do ISR. And so in my mind, that was one example of resilience. I'm not encouraging that in any case or form, but it was just kind of an interesting side note. And then also afterwards, we were discussing it with the team members. We said, well, did you guys really think about, you know, the consequences of creating that amount of debris in orbit? And they said, no. No, not really. We didn't have, really have a chance to process it. Kind of like, I'm not saying Yana's team did it, but <laughs> 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 uh, the, the idea is there was a lot of information and the policyholders did not have a chance to really process that came up a lot. And so the question was, you know, how do you figure out national decision makers, how do they really have a decision making process to fully understand their capabilities? Um, how do you have an appreciation of what the effects are, what you're trying to do? And then the idea of density in terms of that orbital regimes, so does that affect impact uh, decisions in a conflict? So I could talk more, but I'll stop and move on to the next question. Thank you, Victoria. Well, Zach, uh, I, we've heard it uh, today already. <clears throat> we shouldn't treat space as a unique environment. It's another domain of war fighting. Uh, but are there any specifics in operating in this domain? How, what can we learn, for example, about deterrence? Uh, from other domains, how can we uh, utilize it for the space environment? Because I remember uh, General Hyten said that you know space together with cyber are global domains with the where we have the least situational awareness. Uh, does that pose challenges? And how how can we rep? Because we are here talking about space security, so there must be something special about it in a in a sense that we need to learn about uh, how to uh, advance it. I think that's exactly right, and uh, thank you, Yana, for, for having us. Uh, I, I think you've both uh, done a brilliant job of summarizing what happened at, at the simulation, and the question then for all of us is, what are the big takeaways, right? Victoria walked through some of the specifics that we saw, but how does this change how we think about deterrence going forward? And uh, Todd talked about this being the second space age, and I, I think that reminds us that there are other domains where we've seen major changes over time. And uh, one of them that for me is very applicable is if you think about the nuclear domain and the kinds of changes that we saw happen in the early 60s, around 1961, 62, as we started moving away from massive retaliation uh, towards a flexible response posture, right? So this recognition that we are now in a much more complex space environment is actually in some ways similar to what we saw in the nuclear domain, where we had to move away from massive retaliation because it wasn't believable. Uh, people were worried about its ability to deter conventional conflicts. And so we moved towards a more flexible response, three categories, basically a response at the lower level, uh, and then a mid-level conventional response, and then a very high-end nuclear response. And all of those had to be integrated. And so one thing that we've all talked about, which I know will come up more today, is the importance of integrating responses throughout the threat levels. So you can't just focus on space, you can't focus on that domain, you can't focus on very high-end warfare, because when you do, you end up in what we used to call the stability and stability paradox, right? Where you have stability at the nuclear level, and the result is actually instability at the conventional level. And I think we saw some of the same mm -hmm. dynamics in our game where you had a desire to avoid this kinetic interaction at the very high end, but that didn't stop jamming at the lower end, it didn't stop those kinds of uh, escalatory measures. And so we need to think much more uh, carefully about the kinds of measures that we have at the lower levels of escalation. Some of those, I think, are actually relevant to another domain, which we've talked about a little bit the last day or two, which is the maritime domain. So we've been finishing up a big project here looking at gray zone operations and how actors, whether it's the Chinese or the Russians, use gray zone operations to avoid crossing the threshold to a major conflict, but still change the status quo in little ways that advantage them. And one thing we see in those domains is that our adver adversaries tend to use asymmetry, ambiguity, and incrementalism to change the status quo slowly over time and I think we saw some of the same things in the space domain. And so these are challenges that we're going to have to wrestle with as we try and think about how this evolving deterrence concept applies in the second space age. I would just add one more thing, which Victoria touched on, but I think is absolutely critical, and, and maybe it'll come up in the questions and answers. I was surprised by the resistance within the space community to use responses in space to escalations. 
I, I think it's very consistent, actually, with how most experts view their own domains. So uh, we've run cyber uh, games where what you see is a real reluctance in the cyber community to use cyber capabilities, uh, right? Because the experts know just how dangerous the escalation could be in their domain, and they want to avoid it at all costs. And so you see a real interest among experts in going outside their domain, what you'd usually call horizontal escalation. So a preference for horizontal escalation over vertical escalation. And we certainly saw that mm -hmm. in the simulation where you would have a uh, response in space that was a fairly obvious answer uh, that we were sort of trying to get the players to think about hard. And they would think about it a little bit and then turn towards any <laughs> other option, right? They really preferred to think about other non-space escalation options. And I think when, when we ran the game, one thing that for me was quite interesting is if we'd had a room of cyber experts, I don't know that the cyber experts would have been so willing to use offensive cyber instead of space capabilities. And it would have made the challenge much more difficult for some of the players uh, because at some point when you've got all the experts in the room, you have to figure out what your response options are going to be. And you can't keep walking away from escalation in certain domains. You're going to have to accept some risk in those domains. And so for me, that's one big takeaway. When we have a group of interagency experts where everybody is a little risk averse in their own domains, how do you actually think about escalation dynamics? Thank you, Zach. So with this, I would like to open the floor for comments, questions. Please, Russ. Hi, Russ Matievich, Hawkeye 360. Um, being a retired military guy, and you start talking about war games and tabletops, oftentimes we tend to focus on, in this case, just the space domain or just the cyber domain. Uh, especially with those two particular environments, the role that information operations plays, specifically influence, denial, deception, when you are playing in, a, in, a, in an area where you can't physically see something. Mm -hmm. So it's all cognitive. And our leadership, our political leadership, our military leadership are very vulnerable to those types of information operations. Have you guys thought about that and how that impacts the response options available and, and going forward. So, so we actually saw a little bit of that. Um, there was a situation where the yellow team did a cyber attack on some ground infrastructure that failed, but it was attributed to them. The blue team did a cyber attack that succeeded, it was not attributed, and they publicly blamed yellow. Uh, and, and that happened a couple of times. So, so, and there was other instances where the teams were actively managing and shaping the information environment to their favor. Uh, to try and you know confuse things or to try and hide what they were doing, uh, and that did play a, a big role in the game. And the, other, and the other piece was space situation awareness, right? You know, we gave the teams, in some cases, very limited situation awareness about what was going on in space because, you know, I think a couple of the teams we we modeled them as they had you know like an SSN, but a couple others only had a single telescope, right? And so they had to get their data from other players, and and yeah, that, so that had a huge role uh, in the game. Yeah. There's an interesting, in real world, when the Chinese shot down their satellite in 2007, then the U.S. shoots down USA-193, China was publicly pilloried for doing that, whereas the U.S. was celebrated as this great protector of humanity. And it's, it's again, it's how do you shape the narrative? And yeah. that narrative that, affects how, you know, what response options are available. There's some orbital differences in those two things. <laughs> you know, one was at an altitude where the debris persists even today. Yep. Uh, the U.S. Uh, shoot down of the satellite was at a much lower altitude, very little debris That's persisting. That's interesting or not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a more responsible yeah. shoot down, so uh, yes. that makes a difference in, in, in our world. Yeah. Hey, going back to your question, Russ, I mean, that was one of my takeaways I cut, actually, in the interest of time, but, I mean, we live in a WikiLeaks era, and absolutely, there was a lot of disinformation going to the media, trying to play up stuff. One of the teams said they resorted to lawfare, disinformation, and diplomacy in order to offset the weak military position. We absolutely saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Over there, in the back. John Klein with Falcon Research. Because deterrence requires the uh, capability, a credible capability of actually acting, do you think a reluctance to go kinetic uh, 
or do any uh, space control measures is actually interfering with our ability to deter potential adversaries? You know, this is, this is a really interesting question, uh, and, and I hate to go back to the 1960s again, but, <laughs> but you, can, you can ask the same question on the nuclear side, right? Uh, you had national security advisors who have openly said that they suggested to presidents that under no circumstances should they use a full-scale nuclear response. In, in no circumstance, right? So it's kind of similar to mm -hmm. this unwillingness to use kinetic responses. But since you're never actually trying, uh, you're, you're never practicing this as a deterrent threat, it, it still prevails as long as people believe there's some high risk. So I, I think the chance of kinetic escalation still had a major deterrent effect. Uh, but my reading is that uh, each, each team was very unwilling to use kinetic escalation options, but they wanted the other teams to be aware that they might. And so how to, how to signal that was uh, a real challenge in, in the game. So uh, there, was, there, there was actually at least one situation where the team chose to go kinetic against a ground station instead of against a satellite because they didn't want to escalate it to the space domain because they didn't want to lose their own stuff. Uh, and, and I thought that was interesting that they, they were willing to kill people on the ground instead of a robot in space because they didn't want to have the chance of the adversary then estimating against their own space assets that they could not easily replace. Uh, that was an interesting dynamic. Uh, just to follow, I am, I am skeptical of looking at space deterrence, then we could look at nuclear deterrence instead of threat or reprisal. I think there's a world of difference between threatening to kill millions of people with a nuclear weapon and blowing up a robot in space. Uh, I am much more in the uh, you know, d deterrence through denying benefit camp than I am in the deterrence by threat of reprisal camp when it comes to space. Um, but that's... But I think that, you know, to pick up on that, there, there is currently, I think, there is a taboo to using kinetic weapons in space. And I think that we do see a reluctance in people, especially in the space community, to be the one to break that taboo because you don't know where it's gonna lead. Once you break the taboo, it's kinda like the nuclear taboo. Uh, once someone breaks that and they use a nuclear weapon, uh, then uh, you know, are the gloves off? Are, are other people in other conflicts and other situations gonna feel that, well, it's okay because you know, this other country did. The other thing I think we observed is uh, this uh, out of domain escalation, if you can call it that. Um, is that if, you're, if you are a status quo space power, if you have something to lose in space, you may be more inclined to escalate out of domain, uh, to bring the fight back down on Earth somehow, uh, rather than escalating in space. If you don't have a lot to, use in, to lose in space, uh, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. In just one uh, vocab discussion, um, Independent of this, I mean, I think oftentimes people tend to say, well, if we're not doing kinetic, then we're not doing space control, and obviously that's incorrect. There's defensive space control, there's offensive space control, there's a whole series of responses you can do to deter attacks in your space capabilities, independent of a kinetic response. And I think oftentimes our go-to tends to think that way. We'll go back there and we'll follow up front here. Guy Thomas, a retired uh, from the U.S. Navy and from the U.S. Coast Guard, and uh, I was a space ops guy in, the, in my career. And is there anybody here besides me that did the Global War Games in 1980, for 81 to about 87, where we discussed these exact same concepts, <laughs> and you took it to the back to the 60s. And I want to tell you, even in the most bellicose Reagan era, exactly the same thing as what you're saying. I just wanted to say that. That's, we've been looking at these problems for a long time, and we keep coming up with the same answer. So that's pretty <laughs> instructive to me. Hi, Gil Klinger from the Harris Corporation. Uh, to be uh, not intending to be contrarian, I, I guess I would be careful in my own mind about drawing any conclusions based on the sample size for a number of reasons. Number one is I'd, I'd be really interested to know what was the composition of the people in the exercise. Mm -hmm. Number two, I can tell you as a converted nuclear targeting guy in the space business, 
that the space community in the US government at the first order doesn't understand what warfare is. So their allergic reaction to doing anything that's going to sully the environment is almost embedded in people's DNA. But if you had the enterprise battle group commander as one of your participants, for example, or the 18th Airborne Corps commander as one of your participants, I think he or she would say that they never met a solar panel that wasn't willing to die for its country <laughs> a, a lot sooner than an airman or a sailor. I think there, for a variety of good, bad, and otherwise reasons, there is, a, there is an unreality to exercises, as you know, in simulation. Not that they're not valuable, I think they're profoundly valuable, but, but it's one of the reasons, for example, why when I was in the nuclear business, we never had decision makers in their real life positions participating in the exercise for sort of reasons that are probably obvious to everybody. So, you know, I, and I think the other reason is um, at, the, at the first order, I, I agree with you, there's discussions of deterrence in space frequently take nuclear deterrence and raise its altitude. And, and I think at the first order, that doesn't work. That there are certainly similarities, and one of them, I think, is it's the fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. which on the one hand is a huge strengthening uh, factor in, in nuclear deterrence, but also at the moment, given the status of U.S. space forces, is actually a major impediment and, and a potential self-deterrent to, to our own freedom of action in space, so mm -hmm. for what it's worth. So to your question about the, the composition, when we built the teams, we we basically had role, we wanted people with a mix of experience. So for the teams, we generally tried to have somebody with a military background, um, somebody with a, a diplomatic policy background, uh, and somebody with a, with a commercial background, and somebody with a civil space background. Uh, although that last two, we kind of changed, because for example, there was, if there was a team, there was a, a country that had strong commercial space capabilities in the scenarios, we wanted them to have commercial people, but maybe not another team that did not have that. Um, so, so that's how we tried to get that mix in there, but they were almost all space people. To your point, you know, if we'd had more non-space people, I, I think we would have seen a different, uh, a different outcome. And you know, I, to your point, I, I, I agree. War games, tabletop exercises, simulations should never be used to answer questions and develop conclusions. What they're really useful for is sharpening the questions. Uh, I think that's, that's what this helped us do. Uh, and yeah, you repeat it many, many times and you can start focusing your questions more and more. Um, but, and you know, to your point on, yeah, we can't, we can't just say deterrence in space is just nuclear deterrence, you know, at a higher altitude, absolutely. Um, it, you know, there's not deterrence in space, there's deterrence. Uh, it just extends into space. How does it apply in space? How does it work uh, relative to the other domains? Uh, and really, the, the challenge we have now in this second space age is that it's really about conventional deterrence. Uh, and how do you get conventional deterrence um, to hold, uh, not just on Earth, but even in space, especially with the proliferation of all these non-kinetic threats and the, the gray zone type operations that we're seeing already, even in space. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that, I think that's the, the really hard challenge here that we're trying to, to dig into. Right, and definitely, Gil, take your point, the composition does affect it. Um, I will say that one of our um, participants was inspired by this and took the format of our, our, scenario, our tabletop exercise back to her organization in India and um, had a similar yet smaller version of it. She just did one scenario and um, I was able to participate in that um, in February. And that was interesting because that was some space people, but it was more, uh, they don't have as big a space policy community there. So it was more strategic nuclear people there. And again, one scenario, a small group. But again, there was a reluctance to use um, kinetic against um, space capabilities. Again, there's only two tabletop exercises, so you know, grain of salt. Um, Secure World actually would like to start to take this on the road to kind of get a sense from other regions what the interests are, and as Todd said, kind of sharpen the discussion a little bit, not saying we're going to take the, what we get from this and say this is what would definitely happen, but we're hoping to kind of get different viewpoints involved in this discussion. And, and just one last point. That's a big part. We, you know, this just because mentioned is going on in the U.S. 
But what we see, we travel internationally, is that it's not happening as much in other countries. Uh, and so part of what we're trying to do is be able to spark that discussion in the country so they start having their own national discussions to figure out, okay, what is our national take on this? What is our position on this? How would we react to this um, as almost a capacity building sort of a thing? Hi, Matt Jones with the Boeing Company. Thanks, first of all, to the panel for this very helpful exercise and, and discussion. I was wondering, did you, uh, in your exercise, in your tabletop, investigate the, the, element, the temporal element of crisis decision making? In other words, did it ever come into the, the dynamic to, and once again to Russ's point of using even denial and deception, to slow down the pace of what was going on in order to try to affect the crisis that way rather than just by actions? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we saw that happen. We saw some of the teams, uh, you know, deliberately using misinformation. We allowed the teams uh, to communicate with one another, uh, and we observed some of the teams were deliberately telling another team something that was false, uh, and that confused. I mean, I, Yana, you were a participant in one of this. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm not sure how much the teams knew after the fact uh, that they had gotten false information deliberately from other teams. That was definitely part of it. And, I mean, you know, the, we put time limits on the moves. Yeah. Uh, so they, you know, what was it, 30 to 40 minutes? Yeah. 30 to 45 Each scenario minutes. had three moves. Yeah. And we gave them, I think it was, it started out as like 40, then it went to 35, then it went to 30 or 25 for the successive moves. Uh, and, and so, and the teams definitely felt the time crutch, I think, yeah. in trying to figure that out. Uh, and um, so, so the, the, there, were, there was that temporal aspect in terms of we gave them very limited amount of time, and I think they all kind of struggled with that. Uh, we, I don't think we changed the time at all. We, we just had a, a set fixed time where they had to give a response back to us. Um, just like to add, I think actually, yeah, I, mean, I think the level, when we tried to de-escalate, it had unintended consequences, in fact, and I think that was a lesson on its own. Uh, and I would just like to add also, I think most of the people participating were from the same backgrounds and environment uh, uh, and countries, uh, but we have to also take into account in a, a real conflict, we would probably uh, operate or, or have to deal with uh, people that have a different concepts and, and deal with different, uh, so that I don't know to what extent, you know, you can anticipate then certain reactions. Uh, uh, and uh, to be prepared for that. But. Mm -hmm. Just one more thought about this is uh, when you have a real time compression, you start doing the things you have to do, not the things you would like to do. And one thing that I saw go away a little bit was coordination with allies. Uh, when you have real time compression, you, you almost need to coordinate more with allies, but you have less time to do it. And so that's one thing that I think can easily get thrown overboard. And you also end up looking for options that are more reversible, right? So if you're not certain that this is the decision you want to take, mm -hmm. then it pushes you to think about things that you can undo if, if it was perhaps too much. Mm -hmm. um, so the reversible options are uh, attractive for that reason. But the way that the reversible options were read by the targets was as a very serious, irreversible uh, move, as Victoria had said. So uh, that, that is a real challenge from the time constraint perspective. Hi, <coughs> Bruce McDonald. Um, and I wanted to compliment you all. This is a great uh, panel to explore a very important uh, issue. Uh, short plug for uh, a book that uh, I wrote uh, with uh, assistance from Victoria, among others, on crisis stability in space. And, uh, but I wanted to ask, one of the things about space conflict or potential conflict is uncertainty of effects. Uh, that you might do something, and the whole you know, uh, bomb damage assessment, if you will, in space is, is tough, or can be tough. Uh, did you see any sense of risk aversion because of, uh, the uncertainty related to the kind of effects you think you're going to deliver versus the possibility that you might deliver effects either a lot greater or a lot less than what you anticipate. Did you see that playing any kind of a role in the dynamic? Uh, 
It, yeah, and one thing I don't think we mentioned earlier is uh, in the, the gameplay, when we gave people options of things to do in space, uh, we gave them a probability of success, and then we rolled the dice, uh, so to speak, Literally. electronically, uh, <laughs> to determine whether or not um, you know, that it actually succeeded. We also gave them a probability of attribution. Uh, and in some cases, uh, depending on the type of effects you're trying to have in space, you did not have your own battle damage assessment. So if you're trying to blind someone's satellite, you don't necessarily know if you were successful. Right. The other right. country knows. <laughs> yeah, they'll know. <laughs> right? Uh, and so that, that was part of the game, and, and that did play into people's decision making about which options to choose. You know, attribution especially, um, they were trying to do things where they thought the risk of attribution was, was low. low. Sure. But, do you know, for example, though, uh, you may think you're dazzling you, the other guy's satellite, and you may end up frying the electronics. Yes. And they're going to, they may very well assume that guy meant to do that, whereas that wasn't your intent. And, of course, trying to say, well, I didn't mean to do that, that's not going to play very well. In a, in and, a and we built that into the probabilities, and that I think that did happen once. Yeah. <laughs> that, that very example, yeah. they were trying to dazzle, it actually ended up blinding it. But the country that did it didn't even know uh, <laughs> that so they had done it. <laughs> did you see a sort of a self-deterrence phenomenon where, because of the uncertainty, well, a tendency to hold back? I wouldn't say self-deterrence. I mean, the team still did stuff, right? Uh, again, we saw there was almost open season in the cyber domain, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 my, what I was surprised at the the high, what a relatively high willingness to go kinetic attacks on ground terrestrial, right? So it, a lot of it was uh, cyber attacks and then kinetic attacks on C2 facilities, on air bases, <coughs> um, on that that happened quite a bit, and so. I wouldn't necessarily say it was deterring any escalation or any kinetic attacks. There was a, a, a reluctance to go uh, kinetic in space or, or attacking space capabilities, but they just went elsewhere. And this, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I was going to say just one artificiality of the game we had to create just because you had to make things happen. Um, we would say, okay, you want to do a cyber attack? Mm, success, mm, attributed, moving on. Whereas in real life, I mean, you can argue for months what the attribution was of a cyber attack and still never come to a conclusion. But we kind of had to do that just to, just to yeah. make things happen. And just one, one point that builds on what Gil was saying earlier is, uh, so when we were trying to build the simulation, you know, you think hard about what the attribution prospects are, and, and we're sort of making them up. And, and the teams, you know, they had some sense of the riskiness of doing this. My sense is that it, it really did change behavior, uh, that the teams really did think uh, when we sat in with some of the teams, they thought about the likelihood of things like attribution. Uh, and and I, I think that was hugely important. And one thing that we didn't see in, say, the cyber domain was you didn't see a lot of concern about the uh, effect on the rest of the fight, right? Whereas in the space domain, you don't know what the knock-on effects are because space is such a key enabler sure. across the force. Mm -hmm. And so people really were worried about what you might do in the space domain, whereas in a lot of other domains, and this gets back to the deterrence point, you actually know exactly what you're doing. Often in the nuclear domain, in the conventional domain, you take an action, you know what's probably going to happen. There may be some knock-on effects, but they're pretty, mm -hmm pretty clear. Uh, in space, so much harder to figure out. Yeah. If anyone is interested in the, uh, the book uh, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, published, uh, I can give you the link uh, uh, for it. <laughs> Thanks. We'll go over there, and then we'll take a question here. And then Thank you. Uh, an interesting issue I thought that came out on the games <coughs> was the difficulty to build a consensus as to what was a provocative action to various allies and the limits of the notion of reversibility unless you consider all stakeholders and the impact on all of the stakeholders. So I'm wondering whether during those games, anything surfaced that helped you figure what are better ways or things that can be uh, introduced in a process to try and get to that consensus around what is a provocative action? Or, or frankly, you just observe the issue is there and we have to try and find a way to deal with it, but nothing yet uh, out there to point to possible solutions. So uh, we, the, the one element we did not have is we didn't have a lot of lawyers playing. And, and I think that was actually a bad thing in that in, in the, like say in the air world, right, if you're going to plan an air campaign, 
least in the US and most other countries, there's gonna be a legal analysis of the law of armed conflict and, and, and the aspects you can and can't do in protection of neutrals and civilians. Um, that was basically devoid from this because we didn't, we, we had someone who was kind of observing, but we didn't have anyone embedded in the teams that had that background. Uh, but even if we did, I think we would have still not really improved much because uh, you know, there's not a lot of answers as to what the law of armed conf conflict looks like in the context of space. You know, I'm sure the Admiral can talk about the San Remo Manual, which talks about what that, how that applies to maritime warfare, but that doesn't exist for space. So uh, in my mind, that solidified this gap uh, that we don't have in the space world about how the existing uh, international humanitarian law, law of armed conflict, rules of engagement, how that all applies from terrestrial operations to the space world, that's a huge gap that we need to kind of get a handle on. And I think we saw the teams during the game, they were trying to figure out in real time um, what was provocative and what was hostile and how other people would perceive their actions. And so I don't think that there was a clear understanding and they were trying to figure that out in real time. And, and it still, I think, is pretty blurry on where yeah. you cross that line. Yeah, and just to finish up, there is a project underway uh, led by the uh, McGill University in Canada and the University of Adelaide in Australia to try and develop a manual on international law and military activities in space called Malamos um, that's uh, gonna try and do what, what has happened to their domains. Uh, that'll be a couple of years in the making though. We'll be here. Uh, thanks very much, Yusuf Butt, State Department. So uh, my question is, uh, again, coming back to the attribution concept, what was the incidence of misattribution? So, you know, for deterrence, it's a prerequisite that you have attribution. And so how many times did country A think that country B did it, whereas it was actually country C or a natural event? Uh, and the second part of the question is, if uh, was there an asymmetry of the attribution as there is in reality because our SSA is so much better than everybody else's. So the whole concept of taking nuclear deterrence theory and applying it to space seems a little bit shaky where, you know, Russia could see our plumes and we could sh see Russia's rocket plumes and there was this concept of attribution and balance and deterrence did you see this asymmetry of space deterrence playing out and the um, incidence of misattribution? So, as I said, we, we developed the capabilities. We gave certain teams much better SSA capabilities than others. So certain teams did have that asymmetry there and had to rely on other teams for that. Um, as far as the, the misattribution, I'm trying to remember, I think, I mean, certainly when it came to the, like a, an airstrike, that we, I think we gained that as 100% attributable to the people that actually flew that airstrike. Uh, I think the only notion we had where it was potentially uh, an uncertainty attribution was in the cyber, and I think in some of the jamming as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember one of the teams complaining because they said they kept trying to do a cyber attack and they kept failing, yet it kept getting attributed to them, so they were very frustrated with that. Um, but I mean, just in terms like, I couldn't say off the top of my head how many, if it was three or four times, but there were a couple times. And I remember one time, one team did jam P&T services over their own territory deliberately as a way of kind of throwing off the scent. Right. And just one, one more point on this is that, you know, attribution in other domains is also really important and it can be a huge asymmetric edge. So I've been seeing this in U.S.-China discussions where when you talk cyber with the Chinese, the real concern they have is that the US attribution capability is so much greater than the Chinese attribution capability. And it does let us do some things that are highly concerning to them. Uh, but it, it gives us an edge in, in some scenarios. And so I, I think this is one area where, you know, high quality attribution capabilities, it, it is an asymmetric advantage and some teams will eventually use those advantages. But going back to the real world, I mean, the problem with attribution is that particularly for, jam, or for um, radio frequency interference. You know, in theory, if you have radio frequency interference, you can go to the ITU and say, we've tracked down this interference from going back to this particular triangular area. And the ITU can go to the country that's hosting that area and say, okay, there's radio frequency interference coming from your territory, please stop. And that country can be either, yes, of course, you know, we are bad, or they can say, we have no idea what you're talking about. There's no jamming coming from our territory. 
you know, and the ITUs, and that's deliberate. Yeah. But I mean, the, the, so attribution helps, but it is not the end-all and be-all solution for this sort of thing. So that gets something we're trying to get at is this gap analysis. So this is a perfect example where it's maybe possible to attribute deliberate jamming, but at the moment, there's not a whole lot you can do about it aside from asking that country to stop or dropping a, a JDAM on the jammer. Right, and there, there isn't a mechanism in the IT or other places to actually enforce some of that. And, and th for me, that was one of the gaps that we identified is that, well, maybe we need to think about uh, a need to have another option beside, you know, please and blowing something up. So we'll have two more questions. I think there was one here on that side and then one over here and we will, that will be it. And I, but I will encourage you to address speakers after the panel, but please. In the back. Hello, my name is Dean Treadwell. Just my oh. question for the panel is where mm -hmm. do you feel that we lack uh, redundancy in all the systems that we maintain in space uh, as, as you went through this exercise? And, and second, uh, just trying to relate this whole discussion to the overall discussion on missile defense and EMP, what would you have the Congressional Commission on EMP look at as a result of your exercise? Depending. Yeah, I mean, so first, I'll offer a caution. We were playing hypothetical countries, uh, you know, not real countries. Uh, so they're hypothetical capabilities. Um, I, I think we saw where teams, where the, the capabilities we gave them, um, you know, uh, where they only had a handful of missile warning satellites, for example, and they were reliant on them, um, then when, you know, the potential of losing one uh, even through non-kinetic means, just blinding it, temporary or not, um, countries took that very seriously. Uh, and so I think that it, it almost created a, a self-deterrence uh, aspect to it. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, in terms of electromagnetic interference, uh, you know, that was a popular activity during the exercise, a lot of jamming, um, you know, but well, I say that countries, a lot of the teams seem to, you know, be willing to go to jamming, but then, you know, the people being jammed regarded that as very serious provocation uh, in many cases. The, mm -hmm. Any other observations? I mean, just to reiterate again, the one time one country lost the ISR satellite, they just shifted over to ISR air, air capabilities, mm -hmm. which again, in the real world may not be an option, but they had that mission readiness from another, op another uh, method. So that was definitely something, I think, in terms of resiliency, just having the idea is not the asset, the space asset in and of itself is important, it's because what it can deliver. And so if you can get that delivery via another option, there might be a way around doing it. We'll take our last question over here. Thank you, uh, John Harper with National Defense Magazine. Um, in your exercises, did you see the same reluctance among the various players to go after the ground components of space architectures, you know, ground control stations, radars, versus kinetically, you know, attacking a satellite? Well, no. Um, I mean, there was a bit, but, but there was a couple situations, as I think I mentioned earlier, where instead of going after the satellite, they went after the ground control station or the ground capability either with a cyber capability or in some cases with an airstrike or something. And so, yeah, it, there, there definitely, we did see a couple of cases where they were more willing to do the kinetic on the ground, uh, terrestrially, than they were to go after the, 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 the space, the satellite in space. Thank you. So in the interest of keeping the flow of the conference, uh, I will now conclude the panel. Thank you uh, to all your, to all of you here, to the panelists, uh, and uh, I encourage you to, uh, if you have any more questions uh, during the coffee break, you'll have an opportunity. So thank you very much. And so if you'll bear with us for just a second, we're going to do a quick uh, change here on the stage, uh, and Representative Bridenstine will be out next. <laughs>